<laughs> Good morning. It's Wednesday. It's SJU. Welcome to what is basically like our season 10 of The Walking Dead, where all the main characters are dead with the cold. <laughs> We're your supporting characters that AMC hopes are you'll stay Darryl? tuned in for. I was gonna say, is oh, no, I'm not even Daryl. Is he Michonne and we know this is the last <laughs> oh, season? No, no, no. I don't rate a Michonne. I'm like, right. I'm like eight down. You, I am, um, uh, I'm a Carl at a table of Michonnes. That is uh, what I Aww. am. Uh, Michonne to my left, Eric Goldman. Michonne's to my right, Billy, Vanessa Gritton. Thanks Thank for you, being Carl. here. <laughs> oh, Coral. Guys, uh, Kevin Feige is king. Uh, he's yeah. won the Game of Thrones. He has continued little fingering his way across Disney. <laughs> We're going to talk about it, man. Uh, respect to the king. Uh, but that's not all. We're also going to talk about Doogie Howser being in the Matrix. Yep. And we're going to do a bunch of fan questions because we've been neglecting them. And I'm sorry. So story number one, Kevin Feige has the greatest story of us all. This is via deadline. King to Ting. <laughs> Don't, don't write me <laughs> jokes two. I can't say, Ryan. Ryan three, two, two. Curveball, that King one. to Kevin. There you go. You guys <laughs> even talked about the joke before. Yeah. I, <laughs> we try to prep you. It's like I'm bad at this. Uh, is adding the title of Chief Creative Officer for all Marvel movies, TV, and publishing. Mm -hmm. uh, that picture there was uh, him on his stage looking down at all of his subjects. <laughs> uh, and that in the Infinity War hat is him post snap. He looks like Patton. <laughs> like giving his. Oh my uh, God. He does. Like <laughs> we will march forward to Jeff Loeb's forces and stab them in the belly. Uh, that's a thing Patton yelled. Uh, <laughs> grandpas, you guys, they're amazing. World War II um, was crazy. World War II <laughs> was crazy, y'all. <laughs> Jeff Loeb was not an ally. <laughs> Shout out to Mary Marauders. Woo, woo. Page five will explain it all, guys. <laughs> so, according to Deadline, this move is uh, being finalized this week. What this means for the brand is that all of the company's key creative executives across film and TV now report to the Dreadlord. Uh, so, already master of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Feige's oversight will now extend to the overall creative direction of Marvel storytelling and content creation platforms. As a part of this, Marvel TV and animation generator Marvel Family Entertainment will move under Feige's Marvel Studios banner. Uh, I am assuming that includes 90s Pizza Hut VHS tapes of Marvel animated programming. They're back in production. That's a very small division of yeah. Marvel, but it's an important one to me. The, de the decision to place all film and television production and the creative aspects of all publishing under Feige comes at an important point for the company. Marvel is moving into a second phase of its superhero, superhero film franchise launches after an unprecedented record of success in its first decade. So, okay, yeah, everything is under... Uh, uh, Kevin Feige's united yep. the clans, you guys. Yep. He's, he's sure. uh, Star Wars... Aside, that's uh, that's a that's a continent he has stepped yeah. a foot into. He'll send yeah. the fleet there later. Uh, immediate initial reactions to this: Are you guys surprised? I felt like one day. Actually, I should probably say full disclosure: I used to work for Marvel, not Marvel Studios. Uh, I felt like one day this would happen, mm -hmm. but I n didn't necessarily even think it would be under Feige. I just felt like one day it's all going to get. They're going to want to consolidate, yeah. and they still didn't one hundred percent consolidate. Right, certainly. video games licensing uh, yeah. are still under Perlmutter, which makes sense. Like Perlmutter's a money guy. He's yeah. like, a, you've already used enough pens this month, guy. So, like, it makes sense to me that he's going to maintain uh, licensing and merchandising. That's how Disney yeah. uh, keeps their, you know, they, they keep their they, reserves. Yeah, yeah. They that, are that's not, how you keep those 25 mil They budgets. are not willy-nilly with for the Disney pens, Plus. man. Yeah. For, uh, for Disney Plus there. Uh, Vanessa, shocked? Surprised? No, I'm... I'm also not that surprised. I always knew it was going to be someone, and it's not surprising that it's a king to Kevin. Uh, <laughs> oh, sure, you can pronounce it on the first go. It's whatever, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just the one letter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that came up that way. <laughs> and let's pull yeah, you off the booking spreadsheet. <laughs> and... Sorry. Uh, but yeah, uh, he's landed an almost impossible to land, not impossible to land plane, but it being able to execute this the way he has and the fact that they're doing so well in their first year, of course it's going to him. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's not that surprising. Billy? Yeah, this is, I think, for, like, in our bubble and the people watching the mm -hmm. show, it's probably, like, you know, we understand mm -hmm. it's a big deal. Do I think it's a big deal to people, like, general Joe Schmo out there? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But, like, I have a very good friend that works at Marvel TV, and I texted, like, 
You all right over there? And the response I got back was, very weird 24 hours. I, I might have been sending a few texts. Yeah. 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 So, Do not doubt it. Look, the, I don't know if this is in the script or whatever, but the, it's also like this news comes out and then you kind of see what the budgets are for some of these, these Disney Plus projects. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. there's a lot happening right now. Yeah. So... Am I surprised that they're just going to try to like consolidate? No, they've been doing this for years with their properties. So now they're just mm -hmm. doing it with their overhead charts. I, yeah, I just feel like and Marvel. I mean, at this point, right? Marvel seems like their most important mm -hmm. asset more than Star Wars. And the big weird thing with Marvel that was different than Star Wars is it wasn't all under one roof. That the mm -hmm. storytelling that Star Wars was <clears> all everyone was on the same page. That was not the case for Marvel. And sometimes it was more glaring than others. And certainly with the TV shows, it began became a struggle, not just because why are the TV show characters not showing up in the movies, but now, like, why is the Avengers movies not even being acknowledged in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? I feel like, yeah, moving forward, it just shows how important Marvel is to them, that they're like, yeah. Yeah. like we want to have this, really have the same voice. So I have a forward. question. Is publishing, that means the monthly comic yeah. type? Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, that's, it's like uh, movies, TVO, and publishing, like, and publishing. Yeah. Holy right. Lord. Like, yeah. that's a whole well, full-time <laughs> job in itself, and, you know? Uh, on that note, let me ask you guys this. Does Marvel now, as a brand, uh, tie everything together? I'm talking, like, because uh, we don't talk comics a whole lot on yeah. this show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But do they do something like a uh, a DC New Fifty Two hard reset to realign I don't to realign think... things? They've done a little bit yeah. every now and yeah. then, like yeah. uh, a Nick Fury Junior popped up right. in, in Six Sixteen. They they've right. done some reality Marvel bending Marvel events Marvel. that right. have, yeah that have that have uh, uh, folded folks in. It seems <laughs> like the X Men reboot they're doing now is probably the blueprint for how the X Men will show up in the MCU. Yeah. Um, do they do something like that? Do they do a a, a new Fifty Two fold in to really align this stuff? I, know, so I that... mean, any time one of these movies are kind of, like, I remember in like twenty twelve, they put out a Guardians of the Galaxy, and it looked fairly close to what it was going to yeah. be a couple years later. So yeah. I feel like they they already had these mandates like. Hey, if they're not already looking like this yeah. in the next year, can you try to at least they're get already the, priming. the covers yeah. looking like that? So I probably it'll be more aligned, but I don't think you're gonna go see Guardians of the Galaxy three and then that month's issue is a direct tie-in. Mm -hmm. Like I don't yeah. think that's gonna happen. I, I just think yeah, it'll be like you were saying. Like they, they were already the comics would certainly <laughs> reflect the movies and the characters would start. Like suddenly Thor has short hair in the comics and stuff right. like yeah. that. But I think even more that'll probably happen. I don't think they'll do like the hard reboot, like the new 52. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, yeah, it'll just be more aligned, more. And you won't see stuff like now, granted, this the situation also involved 20th Century Fox being a separate company at the time. But like it was no secret that Perlmutter was really big on Inhumans and Feige yes. wasn't. Yeah. And the comics went really big on Inhumans for a while. And it was like its own sort of thing that they were doing. I feel like that's, that stuff will dissipate, right? It's like, because right. everyone's going to be on the same page, because everyone's like, this is what we're doing in the entire big picture. And certainly I do I do wonder if X-Men, because <clears throat> that'll be such a big deal that they can relaunch the movies, that you might see a little more, you know, synergy, mm -hmm. you know, synergy happening there going okay. forward. Yeah. Because, you know, you, you have, in, yeah, in the past, there, there's soft mentions of it, right? Like, oh, Vulture's going to be the villain in the new Spider-Man movie? They're going to do a big Vulture month yeah, in, yeah. in Spider-Man. But sure. I, I'm wondering if, um, at least purely in character design and stuff like that, we're going to see sort of an across-the-board just sort of Probably. shift. Mm -hmm. to... It's going to be wild, though, just like if taking a huge step back and it's like <laughs> the comics reflecting the movies, which were a reflection of the comics. Like, it, yeah. it'll finally come, like... The the uh, the event horizon will happen with it. Yeah, I mean we've been seeing it happen. Kevin Feige would nail speaking Latin at people. I mean we've been seeing it happen since the first Iron Man, where all of a sudden I Tony Stark started to be written yes like Robert Downey yes. Jr. Yes. We've been seeing it happen. Yeah from the get-go, so it's not surprising that that's going to take place. As a huge, like, lifelong comic book fan, though, you know, one thing that people have noted is that, unfortunately, the success of the movies has not been reflected in comic books getting yeah. increasing right. sales. I hope maybe this can help, and I don't know how, like, the, what the secret is, but something they can do that can help, like, pivot off the fact that they're all going to be now, you know, reporting to Feige, and maybe they can make some plan where something can somehow help. I I, I don't know if it will, but I, I think that'd be great mm -hmm. if they yeah. can actually get more people to read You know what, the, one thing that Marvel does do, and I don't know if anyone 
here reads them, but before every Marvel Studios movie, there's usually like a, a prelude yes, tie in yeah. comic, yeah. and they are, for the most part, they're pretty dispensable. They usually don't have anything, sure. but Recapping. I wonder, right? I wonder if those become a bigger part of the strategy, almost like Star Wars, where it's like, you know, you put out Rogue One, and it's yeah. like there's that novel catalyst. Yeah. It's like if you read it, so much context. Mm-hmm. If you don't, you still get what's happening yeah. in the movie. But I right. wonder if there's going to be almost like, a story group that's you made, know, you know? You, you might be onto something because, yeah, barring a hard reboot and saying forget, you know, 80 years of continuity, they can't suddenly say that the movies and the comics are the same continuity. But they could do, like, an ultimate line except it's the studio, it's the MCU. Yeah. Right. You know, they could be like, and they could introduce characters in Something that. like that, Marvel that, Adventures or yeah, X-Men yeah, Adventures Something in like, 90s, that, stuff that like that. Like, these are in continuity 100% with the movies. We can actually maybe much more firmly like set up a character that'll show up on a Disney Plus show. Or sure, yeah. Like mm-hmm. I mean, because we know like, uh, like the first place my head goes because I'm thinking like they do it with Star Wars that's yeah. like, all the yes. adventures yeah. but it's like yeah after Civil War there's probably a year of adventures that Cap and his secret Avengers mm-hmm. team went on and it's like you most likely aren't going to do a Disney Plus show of that to get Evans right. and everyone back but you can do a comic, a, a comic series of that yeah. absolutely yeah. that's what they know? did with the um, um, what they're doing with the most recent Kong and Godzilla coming back is you can read a little bit more about the side characters and right, right. how they all connect to the, each other with comics but you don't need the comics sure, to enjoy yeah. the movies right. yeah. Yeah. well yeah and uh, I actually didn't realize <laughs> they did that I would not mind taking a look at those um <laughs> Uh, and we, yeah, I think uh, Star Wars has done it pretty successfully. You know, um, it, it can be like a little bit of whiplash when all of a sudden you jump into this new trilogy and you're like, what's the First Order and why is it so huge and where's the yeah. government and stuff like that? But they've done some really cool tie ins and books and stuff like that that go, oh, it's this. And it sort of really helps you appreciate the movies a little more. Yeah. Um, man. He, uh, Star Wars is next. Uh. Good, good for him, though. Like it's so funny. A uh, couple months back, I was watching the uh, those X Men movies, like before Dark Phoenix, um, and there was like a, a special feature of on the on the first X Men movie of a fresh faced little Kevin Feige. It's <laughs> so excited and man to to get under the heels of the villainous Avi Arad and actually do what Avi couldn't. Sorry, I everything that Avi touches, I think, is just almost. 100% garbage. But Feige <laughs> took the lessons. Into the Spider-Verse. <laughs> How much was he involved in that? Yeah, that uh, seems more of a hands on a hard body yeah, touch where like, he was he like, wore, I'm still on the truck. He, he was wearing a <laughs> Spider-Man ski hat to the premiere. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> the point is, I feel like uh, Kevin Feige has, has done, look, we give him a lot of credit and he deserves a lot of credit. Also, there's tons of great filmmakers and storytellers, but the, yeah. good, the thing that he does is he finds the people that can make the best overall mm-hmm. product. Yeah. So I I have no doubt that he could probably do it across the board, not just movies, but now let's let's make the TV. Let's finally just like we're like do these count? Does it count? Is it part? Is it it's like let's just take all the question marks off the board. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This guy is capable. I actually don't think that he's going to take over Star Wars. I I, I genuinely think because he's a Star Wars fan, he just wants to do one. It's right. like, yeah, if Kevin Feige wants to do a Star Wars movie, let him do a Star Wars movie. But I don't think this is like a a backdoor pilot to him taking over. Yeah. yeah. And he's and he, and he is one man. So it's like, even with the publishing thing, it's like, I don't think he's going to have the time to be like, here's every issue of every comic coming out next month for you to give your approval. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. it doesn't have to. But, but it I, doesn't have to be. It's the big picture. <clears> I know, full on think yeah. there is a Game of Thrones succession thing going on. Uh, and there is a very joyous version of the Succession intro with Disney characters, uh, <laughs> where it's Kevin Feige is uh, drowning Kieran Culkin in a sink so that he can take over Disney. Um, <laughs> I absolutely think that that is uh, happening, but we shall see, Billy, and we'll, we'll, I don't know. we'll stake I, our friendship on it. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, speak again. sure. <laughs> Not a big loss. Take the bet, business. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh man, it feels like it gets it's better not, today. It's not. Uh, this is dunk on Joe Day. No, I'm sorry. I love you, Joe, and I love the Doctor Doolittle trailer. Please <laughs> stop, guys. It was a show. It was a bit. I don't care about Doctor Doolittle, but I do care about you, Joe. Nope, Joe Star. The Doctor Doolittle trailer you, of Friends. I took Aww. you. I took you on a wrestling date last year. I you took did. The Survivor Series. It did. It yeah. was a fun date. Yeah. It was a real Aww. fun date. Yeah. Guys, you know what else is a real fun date? Watching movie fights. It was it last is. week. It was a solid one. It was all about Joker. It was Greg, Ed, and Dorina who came in.
in and just really annihilated on her first time on the show. Is that her first Great. time? Yeah, uh, she did WonderCon. Oh, wow, yeah. She yeah. went wow. around at WonderCon. You would Con. never think that that was the first time. But if it's not in the studio under the lights. It's, it's, not, it's not canon. Doesn't count, brother. <laughs> uh, it's a great episode. We're really happy with how it turned out. You should check it out. Uh, also, Monday, next Monday, is our next episode of Power Levels. Do you guys like that Batman v. Batman v. Batman? We're back with another one. Uh, this one may shock you. It's about... <laughs> I hate myself so much. Yep. It's about Pikachu and Electro. Uh, this one's great. It's got. It gets really dark. It, it does. does. It gets it really does. dark every time. We've we've shown a clip for this one a few times, and I'm we'll probably end up showing it on this show. To, actually, no, we shouldn't. Because <laughs> it seems like no one likes it. Maybe I'll take a screen cap of just that the the apex moment mm. where like well, we lose people. I am so sold on this pitch. <laughs> it is. Dark and uh, uh, here's my teaser. Remember, uh, tell us in the comments what the most infamous line from the first X Men movie is. Speaking of the first X Men movie, yeah. tell us in the comments what that line is. Uh, it's a question, uh, and in this episode, we answer it. And maybe we shouldn't have. And well, like I said, uh, the big takeaway I got from this is I think, <laughs> yep, she knows, she's got it. Uh, the big takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like fully animated. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Animated. Yeah, it's, it's Guys, quite intense without the context. So look, <laughs> the absolute best thing to me about power levels is that it is very on focus. You guys will be in it, Billy. You yeah. and you will usually be leading a meeting with our science team, right. and you're talking through like, okay, well, how best do we rate? Um, you know, uh, electricity levels between these two characters and stuff like that. And then what will usually happen is Spencer or Roth will say something insane. It's Roth. It's okay, always sorry. Roth. I was, uh, yeah, I was trying to bury the lead a little bit. Never not been Roth. <laughs> it's always Roth. Well, sometimes she won't even be in the meeting. She'll just poke her head in the room and be like, how do we find that out? And everyone will kind of go, ha, 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 and she'll go, no, no, no. And then I'll get an email. So I'll, I'll lift the curtain. I'll tell one specific time. Okay. This is a spoiler. Um, there's one coming up with Thanos, and the scientist, God bless Justin, he's, he's a great guy. He has not understood that we take everything literally here. Mm -hmm. So there was one part of it where we were talking about the Infinity Gauntlet, and scientifically he was like, actually, Thanos is the perfect replacement for like a light bulb because he he's like 100% energy efficient and he produces no waste. Well, produces no waste immediately Roth is like he doesn't poop and I was like no, I don't think it's like that. She's like, "Wait, wait, 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 wait." Does he poop? I'm like, I, I don't know. So then I had to call Justin while he by the way, he's trapping like protons and ions and stuff at, at UCLA, like in a dark, clean room. And I'm like, hey, dude, um, so are A, cosmic rays real because Thanos th feeds off them? And also, how much would he poop if he stood next to the sun? He's like, are you just like calling to chat or is this like a thing that we need to <laughs> figure out? My God. So we figured out how much Thanos poops if he stands next to the sun, and that is coming in an episode. Yeah. I My favorite song yeah. lyric, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Does Thanos poop? I'm standing by the sun. <laughs> I don't know what it says about my brain that when he said, Does Thanos poop? My head went, well, Galactus definitely does. Uh, <laughs> yes. He has to. He has to. He yeah. literally, he eats. Yeah. He, he eats, eats therefore he poops. Yeah. Yes. I mean, this is kind of the conclusion we drew, because I also, this just shows how dumb I am. I thought cosmic rays were a made up comic book thing. No, they're real. They're yeah, like a they're real thing. Real. Yeah. I, I, I they're not lot, just as, in as a little yeah. kid, I was like, gamma rays I thought were made up. No, that's right. real. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff like that. No, they are not just a lyric in that terrible Fantastic Four cartoon theme song. My you God. remember that one? The, 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 the they were hit for. They were yeah. hit by cosmic <laughs> rays. Yeah, yeah. The Ooh. one where Ooh. Stan yeah. Lee would do an intro. Hey, time. true believers. I loved yeah. that. I loved it. I loved it. It was a great show, that Song. Even when I was a kid, I was like, "Whoa!" Fantastic Four. <laughs> That's like, Rescue Rangers. No, no, it was a it's a total rip off of Rescue Rangers. Go play them back to back on YouTube. You think I'm lying? <laughs> you think I'm lying? Well, they totally soon I can watch them both on Disney Plus and solves all my problems. So, chill, <laughs> chill. chill. 
But yeah, I already bought three. <laughs> <laughs> Eric's just preparing for the inevitable time where Kevin Feige also is put in charge of the internet. <laughs> um, yes, all internet. Hey, uh, no transition. Uh, guys, uh, the trailer for our uh, Galaxy Quest documentary is oh, out. Yeah. yeah. Take a look. Man, we're real happy with this thing. It's been uh, a lot of years in the making, and uh, Roth and uh, Max and a lot of people have uh, not slept in yeah. probably a year to get this thing across the finish line. And again, not just get it across the finish line, but like really nail this thing, knock it out of the park. We premiered it at New York Comic Con. Um, uh, it is showing on uh, 600 screens uh, for Fathom on November 26. I'm gonna pause to make sure that's correct. Yes, yes, that is correct. Uh, there is a link in the description for how you can get your tickets. I know a lot of people have been asking, like in the fan questions uh, tab and stuff like that, how else can we see it? Uh, for now, that is how you guys are gonna see it. Uh, I'm sure we'll try to work something out and figure out you know, what the steps are after that. But for now, if you want to see the documentary, you have to uh, make that road trip to a theater that is showing it on November 26. Um, uh, sell it as a way to get out of your house for Thanksgiving uh, to your other family members who are fed up by your like weird uncle or whatever who's been annoying everyone at dinner. Like, hey, let's get out of here and then go see uh, this Sounds Galaxy Quest documentary. Sounds oddly specific to you. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Joe. That's the only way you guys can see the documentary. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm sure we'll... It will have a life beyond that, but for now, I don't know what that life is. So make sure you grab tickets uh, through Fathom. Thank you guys so much for supporting us so that we can get stuff like this made. Uh, it's been really, really cool and fun. We're super proud of it. Uh, check out the trailer and uh, then buy your tickets. You know what else you guys are going to buy tickets for? What? what? The Matrix nice. 4? Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this. This via deadline. You guys heard about this Matrix movie? Uh, earlier yesterday, it was announced that Neil Patrick Harris is joining the Matrix forecast. Several sources also tell Deadline that Jada Pinkett Smith is in current negotiations to return uh, for the Matrix Four. She was Niobe in parts two and three. Mm -hmm. uh, she was in the game too, wasn't she? She was. Yeah. She, her and Ghost were like the two the, the main, main characters, characters, right? right. Yeah. Um, Yep, I could have just kept reading the script and told you that. Uh, <laughs> yep, uh, Enter the Matrix and the Matrix Online multiplayer game. Not yet a done deal. Uh, cast currently includes Keanu Reeves, Carrie Ann Moss, and uh, uh, Yaya Abdul, uh, Abdul Mateen, uh, who is rumored to play young Morpheus. Uh, I think it depends on the take yeah. of the movie. This is one of those weird ones where I'm like, you know, there are other black people in the world, or if it's like it is a weird time traveling, like uh, right. reset young character visity thing. Because I think a few other people have called in that spirit that Neil Patrick Harris is playing the uh, architect. Oh. <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> the that. Other he seems more like he would be like the brother of Mouse from the first movie. <laughs> or he's just playing a version of himself like it's uh, Harold and Kumar. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Bring it all together. Um, yeah. Let's just talk Wonder about that. So that right. you, the man. The they can do it. <laughs> so uh, I, I think there are different levels of excitement for a Matrix sequel at this table. Billy, yeah. yes, you very much like Matrix Two. And I, three. I love all three Matrix movies mm -hmm. a lot. I think there's so much good stuff in those sequels that I get it. People just aren't into. I'm very mm -hmm. into it. Um, there's once you run all of the uh, the architects uh, monologue through Google Translate, you actually can pull out like they set up some really cool stuff that I think a lot of people just like either didn't catch or didn't care. But, you know, the first Matrix iteration that they tried was too perfect. But the second one, that's where like all those ghosts and goblins and demons and all the crazy things that like, you know, we think we see sometimes or supernatural mm -hmm. things like those all existed in a second iteration. because They're like, we'll just scare you into staying here, which mm -hmm. that didn't work either. I'm like, man, like give me a movie in one of those matrixes like and and I always said like it'd be cool if they did it Cloverfield style where you don't know until the end oh, like God. why am I stuck in this hellhole and at the end you realize you're in <laughs> the second like iteration glitch, of yeah. matrix yeah. very confused by the casting if it turns out to be a a young morpheus cuz we're getting current day uh Niobe so mm -hmm. I don't I don't know I I don't know if he's going to be morpheus but 
I would think I would think it would probably be in their best interest to to probably just move everything forward at this yeah. point. Yeah. yeah, they're going to tell new stories. Yeah. Eric, sequels? Yep. I mean, nope. I'm so yeah. I, we I, never talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you know I'm always interested when you know Billy being a big fan of the second and third. Uh, I'm I'm like oh that's cool. Like when you were naming good characters, it's like. Oh, yeah, because I was one of those people who adores the first movie, went and watched it again a couple years ago to Revival Theater. It's like, oh, my God, this is still so great, but really checked out on the sequels. I saw them both. Sure. They just didn't resonate for me. Sure. But I'm excited for a fourth one. Uh, it is one of those things where I was like, oh, okay. I, oh, yeah, Jada Pinkett Smith was in those movies. I forgot about that. But at the same time, I'm always, I'm always for keeping your continuity and seeing if you can make something work. I mean... Hell, you know, Fast Five made characters from Too Fast, Too Furious, uh, you know, ones that people mm-hmm. invested in. So I think anything's possible, and it's kind of sorry. Cool. Pause. You, you guys didn't invest in Too Fast, Too Furious. <laughs> not, not fully, not fully. I actually really liked it. I like Too Furious. It's my favorite one. It has a jet ski race. It's just, it's, it's the first one that felt like we know this is dumb, so let's just be dumb. Does have the uh, yeah. line Oasis in mm-hmm. it. Um, but <laughs> also, if you if you go in with the headcanon that your two leads are desperately in love with each other, but society won't let them be together, there's a lot there. Anyway, sorry, go Barstow ahead. Barstow wouldn't allow it. Um, exactly. Yeah. That wrestling yeah, scene takes <laughs> new context now in my head. Canon. Right. Thanks, Joe. But, uh, yeah, so I am excited for the fourth one, uh, and I think, you know, uh, why not bring in these elements? But, yeah, I, I, it will be interesting to find out what exactly the story is. Like you were saying, it's like, are there flashbacks? Is the Matrix, are they going to go into some other sub-Matrix mm-hmm. with younger versions? There are characters back in this movie that are supposed to be dead, so, yeah. yeah. It's it's weird. Hey, Vanessa Gritton, <laughs> you are yep. our oh, resident yeah. Just saw the Matrix for New the first Matrix. time. Wow. Pretty, yeah, you are yeah. you're the you're the Neo of this uh, of this uh, fan. Twenty years seemed like the right time. Yeah, it, it, it felt about the right time. It uh, <laughs> it was one of those movies where I'd waited so long to watch it that I was afraid it wouldn't live up yeah. to what everybody told me it would be. So I went to go watch it for the first time when they did a screening uh, at the Vista, and I loved it. Watched it twelve times in two weeks. Loved it. Because it. Right, I love the Wachowskis. I love everything else that they've done. So of course I love the Matrix. And when I told everybody that I was gonna watch two and three, everyone made the face. Uh, and uh, have you I'm, watched them? Yeah, and I'm gonna say, Billy, you right. Ooh. You right, Billy. Ooh. There are redeemable things, and I even because I still have all my old consoles, uh, borrowed my brother's copy of Matrix Reloaded. Wow! And it made uh, two and three make more sense as well. It does. So. It's it's one of those things we were just saying where it's <laughs> like it's kind of a bummer that you need another piece of media yeah. to fill mm-hmm. in those gaps, but mm-hmm. boy, do they fill in some like crucial right. gaps. Well, I mean that's yeah. that's what we're talking about though. Uh, circling back, that's what we're talking about with Marvel. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Is that uh, this is the the analogy that I used with you when we talked about. Matrix. It's like if you go see the Matrix, it's like going. You mean to on a, Hot Takes with Billy Business, my episode about the Matrix that everyone should like and subscribe to? And, absolutely. And to. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But I said it's like going to the like seeing the Matrix. is like going to a restaurant and getting a delicious piece of salmon. This and then juicy you, steak. It's it's a it's a it's got to be salmon for this metaphor. To work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, shut up. No, uh, <laughs> Joey Pan's reference. <laughs> no, I, I, I hear you. But it's like going to this restaurant, getting a delicious piece of salmon, then you go back home, you're like, I gotta go back, I gotta get another one. And then you go and you get like salmon sushi. And it's just as delicious, but it's so radically different mm. in its presentation that like, it's hard to adjust your expectations of what you're gonna get out of the next two. So my hope with Matrix 4, and I truly don't know because I feel like this nostalgia kind of era that we've been in has kind of wiped the slate clean on a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I hope if the Wachowski sisters are at the helm, they still have that drive to don't listen to the criticism, tell the story you want to tell rather than uh, just kind of like, let's just do the Matrix again. But now that it's 20 years later, we'll just kind of update that that same story. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd rather them take a huge swing like like Reloaded and Revolutions than bunt and do the same movie again. You know? I feel like Sense8 proves that. Definitely, yeah. like definitely. Sense8 proves yeah. that at this point, they're just 
they're just making what they want to make, and that's what I want to see. Yeah. It's why also, I Sensei fell in love with perfect, them with and you should watch Sensei. Sensei is great. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw the wrap up movie. I just remember laughing a lot because I read it, like I read a very enthusiastic response and and it's got the biggest orgy yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's Sensei. That's the, that's the sci-fi I need. That's right. That is the sci-fi I need in my life. Uh, hey, you guys want to hit some fan questions? Yeah. Oh, Let's yeah. do it. What if you were all like, now we're wrapped and you guys walked away? Um, <laughs> uh, Chan, not, uh, Chan John Wynn asked, What's a movie that was too limited by the technology of its time? Uh, so mm. VFX-wise, or I'm, I, I was thinking about this one on the way in, and I think the original Clash of the Titans, mm. uh, which we watched in school to learn about Greek mythology instead of actually learning about Greek mythology. Um, I think there's such a huge scope uh, to that film that even if it had just been released a couple of years later and been paired with like uh, Jim Henson Studios, or something mm -hmm. like that for its practical effects. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the movie could probably still hold up, but I, I think just a lot of what they were doing was still, effect-wise, was still very much like um, pre-George Lucas, pre-Henson, uh, pre those visual effects houses. And so it just yeah. feels a lot, lot rougher. You know, those sort of yeah. campy moments where it's like, I'm fighting a illustration, you know. Is it, this is a hard one for me because I I'm like very charmed by old sure. effects. You know? uh, absolutely, sure. that's yeah. where I'm having a hard time. Yeah, too. this is a really tricky one for me. Like first, that was more like budgetary. I'm like Superman four, where like the budget is so severely cut from the other ones. Like mm. th like a movie from ten years before. The first Superman from ten years before has way better effects than Superman four. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, up the budget on that one. But uh, I did think I'm gonna go for a weird, obscure, specific horror one here. But Hellbound, Hellraiser two. Yes. Because because it was very ambitious. Because yeah. it was like they went into hell a lot in that movie and they had like big things happening but they clearly couldn't pull off exactly visually what they wanted to do mm -hmm. so I was just talking to someone about the first two Hellraiser movies and that was on my mind so there's yeah because I know with the first one too based they ran out yeah. of special effects budget pretty yeah. quickly towards the end but I feel there. like the first one could get away with it because it's yeah. like basically a house where creepy things come to but the second yeah. one we're like we're gonna go into hell yeah and couldn't yeah. quite do that yeah uh you know, anytime I think about things that have been limited by technology, it tends to be cosmic horror, because cosmic horror is really, really hard to do unless mm -hmm. you have a high budget. Sure. Uh, like, one super quick one is The Mist, because it's a great movie, but the CGI is a little bit off, but if you watch it in black and white, it does compensate. Yeah. But I'm going further back with Stephen King cosmic horror, mm -hmm. the uh, made-for-TV movie The Langoliers. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you can't yep. find it anywhere, but everybody <laughs> in it is giving a performance everyone's treating it like it's a movie so it's great but once the actual like langoliers appear they look like fuzzy pac-men uh that eat sections of the screen yes. and it <laughs> takes it all away yeah uh so i feel like the langoliers would be saved if we like gave that a shot again with our current technology billion man i'm i'm with you where it's like every example i'm coming up with it's like but that's kind of why i yeah. love it you know yeah, yeah. i think <clears throat> Just because the movie is like 99.9% .9 spot on minus like two shots, that's just like, that's all you could do at the time. I would say uh, Jim Cameron's first Terminator, mm -hmm. where it's like the effects are so great, even today with like yeah, the yeah. makeup and everything, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's the, the stop motion walking once yeah. the once the human skin is shed. Like yeah. there's just like three. And there's three, that one part with the puppet Arnold. That yes. Takes yeah. Out of yeah. Scene, so it's like know? if I could George Lucas special editionize yeah. it, I might go back and just like just patch those parts but again like it's still it's it's charming so yeah. I, I actually kind of think like a lot of times especially with like those 70s 80s movies mm -hmm. where it's like the limitations of technology actually probably produced a bit like with a Jaws you know yeah, yeah. Yeah. if you could show Jaws uh, the whole movie would that have it made Jaws work. less yeah. effective yeah. you know uh, they were going to do that that similar uh, stop motion approach uh, I think you can find it all online now uh uh, but Jurassic Park originally, there are yeah, yeah, of yeah. The, of stop motion did. raptors yeah. of the yep. kitchen sequence, yeah. and ooh, it's, it's very uh, Rankin uh, Bass Christmas special. Yeah, it's <laughs> very weird. It's very weird. And it was considered for uh, the first Godzilla movie, but it was way too expensive, so they went with Suitmation, and now that's why every kaiju looks like that. Does anyone remember Which, the Weird Al uh, Jurassic Park music video? Yeah, because that's what I'm picturing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not, not far off. It's right. Not far off. Uh, uh, I think that's interesting too. The fact that like um, budget limit 
limitations for something uh, created the visual glossary yeah. for the whole genre moving forward. I think that there's something really, really cool about that. Um, and also, you know, movies now get limited by the technology of our time. Like, I think sometimes just the approach of, eh, it can be CG. Like, I, that's not always helpful. You yeah. know, that's, right. uh, you know, the Hobbit movies, I think, suffered from, eh, it'll just all be animated. Uh, as yeah. opposed to, you know, we're going to try to do a bit of a mix. Like, I still think Fellowship of the Ring is probably the best looking mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings movie to me because that's the one that seems the most balanced with how they're trying to trick you and do their effects and yeah. stuff like that. It looks like there's a possibly an animal movie coming out at some point that may suffer from this problem. I can't oh? recall what it's <laughs> named. You mean the biggest uh, hit of Christmas? Uh, Post-Christmas, because it's not, uh, it might oh, not no, be good enough for... Oh, you're the other universal animal movie. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. There's one in December, uh, and then there's one, there's one in December specifically about one kind of animal, and then there's the one in January. With I don't one. think you have to be coy about that one, because I have no idea oh, what cats. it is. <laughs> oh. Yeah, Cats and Doolittle are both universal, so there's like, I hope this oh, is man, they're they're just, cats is a yeah. Cats is a perfect gift from, uh, from Jesus, really? and, <laughs> and we don't deserve it. <laughs> Well, I'm not, not ready <laughs> to receive it. this gift. We've earned it. Yeah. We deserve cats. We absolutely do. Guys, what if you go We're see cats sure. and you're like, damn it, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. And you're going to walk all of it back. I Look. <laughs> I will. I will if it does. I think we are going to have Joker level arguments About in cats. the weeks around cats. <laughs> I really think we're going to. Maybe not quite the same type right, of argument. Right, right. yeah. <laughs> the social commentary, but like the level, uh, the level of the intensity, intensity. Right. yeah, will will definitely be there. Uh, Jonathan Ortega asks, "What are the best scary horror films, and why?" You guys like spooky stuff. Yeah, Billy sometimes. But uh, if I have my scarity blanket, then you can do it. Then I can do then it. You can totally yeah. do it, Vanessa. Uh, I'm gonna bring up two that I've been watching a bunch lately. Mm -hmm. Uh. I've mentioned this before, but I've been rewatching Candyman a bunch just because Tony Todd's performance in it is amazing. Because before we even get to like the very visual scary parts of it, just the way he says Helen's name is horrifying. Because ah! yeah. he's also the kind of villain where you kind of feel like he gets to do this. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, which makes it all the more terrifying because it's very that like give us our daily bread. Oh God, we've had this coming, uh, and. Blair Witch. I don't think anything weaponized its budget quite as well as Blair Witch did against its audience. Mm -hmm. By being so unassuming, it's still pretty terrifying because it it's such a common feeling that people have because a lot of horror movies sometimes are not that scary because you're like, well, I wouldn't find myself in that situation. But we all have that idiot friend that's way too confident that might lead you somewhere and you just kind of go with it because they've gotten you out of it before and we've all been lost. So there's something about Blair Witch that continues to be terrifying and it's that common thread. I went to college with uh, the brother of Mike from Blair Witch. Oh. And he's on that. Remember I'm when sorry for his loss. Sci-Fi. Well, that's the funny thing, because Sci-Fi Channel did that special that yeah. tied into it. And my classmate was on that special talking about his dead brother who wasn't really dead, because they that's how much they were selling that movie. He put up wanted posters. And right, right. Yeah. I'm like, I, isn't that weird, though? He's like on this special. They showed it. Really uh, Mike. Uh, yeah, they, they, they showed it. Um, with I think like zero context at uh was it the Baxter in Louisville, <laughs> and uh, bless, uh, bless, bless you, you. and um, control yourself. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you let him on camera once uh, this week, and so now he's sneezing and just uh, just unprofessional, unprofessional. Um, uh, and they, they they showed it with no they didn't show it with credits they didn't show it with any context they just showed it. And um, uh, we had some friends pop over uh, to uh, at my house like immediately after the show, and they were just panicked, like th they didn't want to be by themselves. <laughs> right, and, right. Yeah, and that was legit. It yeah. was crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think my mom thought it was real. <laughs> I think she was like, poor well, the, the, the poor sweet thing. The yeah. paper says. <laughs> I do remember the cast saying, in retrospect, they wish they hadn't used their real names. But <laughs> yeah. Oh, right, right, uh, right. I did watch Candyman 3 for the first time recently. Not as good as Candyman. No. <laughs> Weird does how that, that works sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, would, uh, I would definitely go with, uh, and it's funny, I know it's hard with these classic movies. A, because I grew up watching them a million yeah. times, and also because you don't know. Sometimes you say, watch this movie, and they're like, eh, it was cheesy or whatever. I'm still an exorcist all timer. I'm about to lend mm -hmm. it to my physical therapist for my back issues who's never seen it. Uh, he's like, I have that movie. Um, so I still go by the actresses. <laughs> you gave me the whole context and I still don't understand the A to C on that one, but sure. <laughs> well, it's, 
so hard too because horror is so subjective, right? Like, yes. um, I know a lot of people love. Uh, I haven't seen Chapter Two yet. I I didn't enjoy the new It. I, oh, I, I don't that, know. That it actually just, passed my my scaredy right? blanket approval. I have not seen Chapter Two yet. Yeah, either, it just whatever for whatever reason it just didn't land didn't for me. Him. I don't know. Sure. It's super weird. We had a fun conversation before mm. uh, we started rolling today about Child's Play. Yes. And we should have that conversation on air. Not yeah. to put you on the spot. But uh, I loved it. No, I'm a I'm a big slasher junkie. Uh, I love tracking the genre and the way that it's evolved. Yeah. And Child's Play has been the most interesting one that I've been re-watching just because it is the only slasher movie where the actual slasher gets character development. Oh, yeah. Uh, you don't get that from anywhere else. We don't... We learn Michael Myers' backstory. Mm -hmm. We learn more about Freddy Krueger. They don't ultimately don't, change. They don't change and they don't really have development. And also, even when you like them, you're not really rooting for them the way you are, like, Charles Lee Ray, where you're like, he married the love of his life, even though they kind of deserve each other, and they had had kids, and he's come to terms with the body that he's in, and I think that's why I love <laughs> him so much, because no. he just rolls with the punches. <laughs> I never thought that a critique of Child's Play would be like body acceptance, <laughs> but it like body because image because acceptance. Because in Seed of Chucky, he realizes he doesn't want to get out of the body yeah, anymore. He doesn't want. He's he like, no. I love being a killer doll. After yes. all those years of thinking his happiness would come from getting a new human body, he comes to self-acceptance. He chases yeah. Andy the way we chase like future us that don't right, exist. Right. Where it's like, oh, this is the person I'm going to be someday. And it's like, no, be the person you are now. And yeah. that's what Chucky does. I 100% am with you. I love the Child's Play movies. Yeah. And I do love that it does veer by the fourth, the right of Chucky being the big <clears throat> cha changing point where like, you know what? We're going to pick Chucky. He always talked. He was always funny. But on the fourth one, no, he's going to get like full scenes, yeah. sitting often with another doll, and we're going to see what makes him tick, what kind of yeah. music he likes. We're going to like... Rob Zombie. All... <laughs> yes, he loves Rob Zombie. Uh, he's not a fan of Martha Stewart. Yeah, uh, yeah. so we're going to learn like all this stuff about him, uh, and I love that, and I also love that the, that series goes from like, we're being straight up horror, to we're being a little winky, to no, we're flat out comedy, and then yeah. back to horror, so... Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you. With I love Child's Play so much. It's it's out of all of like the slashers that have a large series, it's the one where I have the most fun with the highest percentage of them. Oh no, yeah, same here. You, yeah. should, you should see our house. My wife and I are, go big on Chuckies. There's like a lot of Chuckies there. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> There's a lot of Chucky and Tiffany in our house. They're all sitting at the table. Oh, and sometimes <laughs> she did bring our life size Chucky, the full size one, to the opening of the Alamo Draft House here, where I think about 50 people took photos with him. Oh, uh, <laughs> sweet Chucky. But since Jonathan did ask about scary specifically, I do want to throw out uh, the Descent, which is actually just the Descent's one of my, yes. fantastic. One of my favorite horror movies of this millennium. Uh, but also, I think the Descent is so effective because even before the creatures show up, it's pretty damn freaky just because mm -hmm. anyone who's ever felt claustrophobic watching that movie, it could just be about people trying to get through this horrifically small cave. Yeah. And there are sequences that are really, really just, oh my God, yeah. uh, before the creatures show up. Yeah, that movie scary. could, uh, uh, because it's a, it focuses a lot on, um, you know, obviously just uh, man versus environment, or w women versus environment in this case, but... Uh, um, which is scary and uncomfortable. They're spelunking through these yeah. these caverns, uh, and also, you know, the inner turmoil problems between the group. This yeah. is a group that is it no longer issues. healthy and has some issues. And uh, without giving too much away, you know, start to kind of turn on each other a little bit. And I think even before monsters show up, like that in itself is a scary, scary movie. Like yeah. that's a yeah. really intense situation. It's, it's a really brilliant thing. movie. Yeah, yeah, it really, really is. Yeah, it, is. it absolutely Good double is. Feature. Yeah, you never um, really do that. Ombre to California One asks, "What is a movie you'd love to uh, do? I'll say C for the table and honest trailer for, but you know, no one would watch it." Uh, we're in the YouTube business. There's a lot of things that we'd love to talk about all the time and make video series for, and no one will click on them. So those things don't happen. Um, uh, I think I think four of you really want lots of anime from us, but you're the only four that watch it. So you know stuff like that. Uh, so is there a movie that you've always been like, this is one I, I wish the group would take a shot at or something like that? But we know we won't do it because no one will see it. I would love. I would literally probably be me and Scott Mance would, and Ken Napsok would be the only three that would love to see it. But I'd love to see you guys take a crack at Magical Mystery Tour, which is the the weirdest. <laughs> <laughs> 70 minutes where the Beatles were just like, let's just, it's not even like, let's just film ourselves going around London. It's like, let's film ourselves like 
doing the weirdest things around London. And there's kind of a story, but not really a story. But yeah, I would love to see you guys do that one. If I've you haven't seen Magical seen Mystery Tour. I never have. I have not. How have you? Oh, my God. There's just like. Office screening? Uh, yes. It is. <laughs> it is like part horrifying. There's like strippers. There's like suffocation by spaghetti. Yeah. There's um, dwarf tossing. Um, there's eggs, eggmen and walruses. It's it's just all where else are you going to find the Beatles doing a live performance of I and the Walrus in a music video form? It's, it's such a strange movie that I would love to even just see you and Lon and Danielle and Spencer like even try to like, it's like make heads or toes. Have you seen it? I've seen it and Tommy in terms of like band movies where it's like, oh. At least Tommy, what? like, <laughs> Tommy, you could tell, like, like they, amb yeah. they ambitiously thought that they were going for something. I have no for idea. What? <laughs> no, I'm saying they thought. They thought. I'm pretty sure the Beatles are just like, whatever, man. Yeah. Just, like, uh, we're, we're high. Yeah. We're high. <laughs> Vanessa? Have y'all done Maximum Overdrive? No. I no. want Maximum We've Overdrive. We mentioned it in yeah. like other Stephen King trailers. I would. Oh, God. I, Maximum Overdrive is one of those movies where when watching it, you're like, this movie can't get more bizarre. And then you learn about the backstory and you're like, it got oh, more oh, yeah. bizarre. Both just uh, occurrences on set, the fact that many of like the dummy bodies were also dummy bodies from Dune. Uh, Stephen the, King saying he doesn't remember making it because he's on cocaine. He, Stephen King doesn't remember <laughs> making it. And also because it was right next to where they were filming Blue Velvet. So right. that was just like mayhem. <laughs> uh, That's insane. It was mayhem. And then like That's so in the trailer, <laughs> that you could see uh, online. It's also on the Blu-ray for Maximum Overdrive. I Keep in mind, this. this is Stephen King uh, just yayed out of his ever-loving mind. He insinuates that he could direct one of his movies better than Stanley Kubrick. Uh, and he oh, says they, this... Yeah, they were not happy with He you. says this into the camera where he's just... He, he doesn't say, I'm a better director than yeah. Stan, Stanley Kubrick, but he's like, this is what's going to happen. And then you watch the movie and you're just like, Stevie, oh, God. <laughs> Stevie, <laughs> baby. That ends with him going, I want to scare the hell out of you. Yeah, yes. at this point. Yes. And yeah. then they hold for a really Perfect. long time, but they don't freeze, so you just like see so the finger like, wiggle. Right. <laughs> I think that is where, um, I think specifically that material is where Garth Merengue's Dark Place was I born honestly think on the so. BBC, which have you ever seen? Uh, just clips. My oh, oh God, so it. worth I jumping know, into. So the I think, talked. I think most of it's on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of my favorite, the, I can't remember the actor's name. I th he's been in many larger things now, but he's my favorite like F level character in the BBC office. Um, the guy that keeps uh, correcting Gareth on Bruce Lee movies oh, yeah. um, uh, made this uh, series, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, which is a full on just like Stephen King, you're insane and ridiculous. And it's so worth checking out. I think it's all on YouTube. It's, it is, it's, it, I watched it all on YouTube and it's incredible. I would go with, uh, so the, the classic one for me is Transformers the movie, mm -hmm. which uh, the animated one, which uh, you guys, it's now almost like a bit where it's always on the calendar, always, and we always bump it. Something happens, uh, we get a sponsorship, uh, and they want a specific movie, or uh, a Transformers title goes away, or whatever, but it's always on the calendar and we never do it. Uh, but uh, the ones that would no one would watch, but I would love to do them, is there's um, a collection of ninja movies from the 80s, uh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, have I, I, I've, I've yelled at you about Godfrey yes, Ho before. Yes, okay, yes, so yeah. there's um, there's this collection of movies by this producer named Godfrey Ho. Uh, he cast a bunch of like B and C American actors to be in one movie, okay. and then he bought a bunch of Z budget Filipino martial arts movies, uh, cut up his movie, shoved it into those, and Perfect. made like. 10, 10 movies called like Cobra vs. Ninja, Ninja in the Valley of the Unicorn, oh, Ultimate yeah, Ninja all Terminator. Of, oh, Ninjas yeah. Those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy. All of yeah. those. Um, and there, remember like uh, Kung Pao, mm -hmm. Enter yeah. the Fist? It's yeah. those, but real. On purpose. It's those, but on purpose. Right. That's not the one with the gymnastics one you made me watch, was it? Remember it was Where like they the, oh, that's, spin that's, around and they. That's Ninja you know, that, 3. Uh, the, the female? I think no, no, no. It was like a guy who literally does gymnastics while he's fighting people. Was that That's Jim Cotta. Oh, Jim Cotta. <laughs> That's, That's Jim Cotta. Oh, okay, no which we yeah. should also do an okay, audition. No, no, the guy who like finds a pommel horse yeah, in the middle of town. Like, That's Jim Cotta. Yeah. That's Jim Cotta. Okay, never mind. But yeah, these were just, um, they're just 
terrible and amazing. And like right in the first few lines, is you know a guy's like, uh, "I'm go, I'm the best ninja." And then a guy's like, "No, the best ninja right now is Gordon." And you're like, "What?" <laughs> and he's like, "I'll challenge Gordon." And he's like, "Gordon will not accept your challenge." And he's like, I'll, "He'll have to when he accepts my ninja challenge card." And you're like, "Okay." This sounds wow. like, like the Game Boy back and forth. <laughs> <style>. <laughs> it absolutely, yeah. it absolutely does. That's pretty solid. A ninja challenge card is one where if you punch it ten times, a ninja can't say no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bought ten sandwiches with this. Now we sword fight. Uh, they're all on YouTube, and they're all completely worth watching. Uh, hey, Vanessa, where can people find you I on mean, the internet? Oh, God! <laughs> I'm going to throw a knot. What, you guys... I didn't even go to you, I don't think. I apologize. It's okay. You guys haven't done Twin Peaks, right? We never Peaks, <laughs> no, we've never done Twin Peaks. I'm gonna go more specific. I just I wanted to get the context of that because I didn't think you did Twin Peaks because I would say really specific is Twin Peaks Fire Walk with me. Oh, I that's you a really already, good yeah. one. Which I think would be really fun. And then there were so many like a, you know cult horror movies, but the one I'd really love you guys to do is uh, Slipway Camp. Just because. Oh, that, oh, that, that, yeah. That, yeah. That I adore ending. that movie, yeah. the ending, but everything before the ending. Sleepaway Camp is so great to me, and I've watched Sleep. I watch Sleepaway Camp about once a year, and then I always listen to the How Did This Get Made episode about yeah. it because it makes me laugh so hard as they try to like logic out that movie and the backstory mm -hmm. and what they reveal. So that would be yeah, uh, uh, an amazing uh, one that I don't think would ever probably happen. No, <laughs> but, you know what? Better chances I think are. All of Twin Peaks. Yeah, all that's what I thought is like but maybe like an entire Twin Peaks. Movie. Like doing the whole run plus yeah. Firewalk with me plus the new one all together. But right. I don't know why we do it. Right. Like you got because gotta, you can. Because I mean, because we can. <laughs> we have the technology. Yeah. But that one's interesting. I feel to like me. once a year, don't you like guys do like one that you're like, I don't care if no one else likes this, we're doing it. it especially like uh, in the spring, like before. Well, like January through May, before things start happening, is a lot of like that's how you get like uh, the Ninja Turtles coming out of our shells tour right. and. Well, stuff next like spring that. is the 30th anniversary of Twin Peaks. I'm just pointing. Oh it boy, out. Just, just pointing it. Just make Dan do it. I can't, just make Dan I can't, do can't wait until Dan and Spencer text me like, "What did you do on air?" Um, <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, man, well, I just set myself up for a horrible work disaster. Uh, slash, watching all of Twin Peaks uh, very soon. Thank <laughs> you guys. Uh, hey Vanessa, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on at Nesgrit in all forms of social media. Um, if you're in Los Angeles, October 27th, come check out Nitrous at the Back Theater. Uh, we have to put up a tarp because we are getting messy with this one. Yes, Ooh. Night yes. Church is a fantastic. I honestly yes. think that, uh, so they do like really like macabre, like if, if like B-movie horror had a sketch group, like awesome. they're it. And I, <laughs> I, I honestly, store dorks. <laughs> like I really honestly th think that it's gonna blow up. It's so oh, it's you. so original and just weird and different and its own thing that I, I really think it's going to do yeah. well. It's super fun. We're if you're... all messy nightmares. And uh, for this one upcoming, we actually have um, Alejandro Motoya, who's one of the directors from the Rebel Without a Crew series. Uh, and he's going to do a Q&A because we've been wanting to do filmmaker Q&As at the top just because uh, we love B-movies. So we just love people that encourage people to just go out and make stuff with just what they have. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so um, you tweet about the shows and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So if uh, if you're in SoCal, make sure you guys check one out. They're super, super fun. Yeah. Billiam, anything you want to plug? Uh, just uh, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast. Hot Takes, Billy Business. And download the uh, the episode we did about uh, Matrix Reloaded and, and Revolution. I did my best to talk about them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, them well. you, can, you can hear my deeper thoughts on why I think those sequels are It valid. is a good episode. Yeah. It is a good episode. Eric Goldman, uh, is there anything, first of all, on uh, fandom.com people should be checking out? Uh, there's various things that I'm blanking on. But you know what? Uh, I know you guys have talked about, uh, in general, the psychology of the Joker pieces on here. But now that all four of them are up, the three we did beforehand, and the one we mm -hmm. did on uh, the Joaquin Phoenix version of the Joker. I'd say check them all out. They're really good. I They're love that. really, really good. Yeah, uh, the psychologist we use also works at UCLA. I feel like we should have our own little division at right. UCLA. Yeah. Right, yeah. Our think tank. I wonder if they know there. each other. Right, yeah. Oh, you, they, they bother you too? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's all in on it. I mean, she's Arkham Asylum doc on Twitter, so you know she's, commi yeah. she's oh, uh, committed. She's committed. I made a joke I didn't even mean to make. There. Uh, and then uh, personally, uh, we enjoy wrestling podcasts. You can also subscribe to, except apologies for this week's episode where we the first five minutes uh, we didn't get because of technical difficulties. But anyway, listen to it, uh, and there you go. Right on. Guys, thank you so much for watching. We will see you tomorrow where if anyone is not sick anymore, we'll talk about Bessinger, question mark. See you tomorrow. Bye.